Hi there, and thanks for joining me. My name is Dr. Travis Pashik. I'm a clinical psychologist and associate professor at Saginaw Valley State University in Michigan of the United States. I'm making this video as a supplement to the poster I'm presenting at the 2021 Association for Psychological Science convention, which is, of course, occurring remotely. As much as I would like to connect with you face-to-face, -face, this seems like a decent way to approximate that for the conference, and I'm hoping that people will reach out and chat with me about seminar teaching. I should note a couple of caveats about the presentation. First, I'm just really privileged and lucky to be able to teach seminar courses. Uh, I love it. Um, at my university, a seminar course is capped at 15 students. And so with a setup like that, we're able to really connect and sort of have deep, intimate conversation with one another. Uh, and that's where I really feel like my teaching shines. I also teach a number of larger courses, but uh, the seminar classes are some of the ones that I find the most meaningful and rewarding. So that's part of why this was the focus of the presentation today. Secondly, I, I do understand, of course, that this may not be relevant to everyone's interests. With my background being clinical psych, my seminar courses tend to be about mental health, assessment, therapy, those sorts of things. That said, I think you can take the tips and suggestions that I'm providing in this presentation and apply them to most all seminar courses. Um, hopefully uh, to yield some improvement in student engagement and significant learning experiences that your students have. So while I think that a number of the concepts presented in the poster are relatively self-explanatory, I wanted to elaborate on just a couple of things in this video. The first thing I'll mention is this notion of expanding engagement. What I really mean is broadening how instructors define class participation and engagement. I think a number of us assume that if a student is talking during class, that that is what participation is. And I would encourage you to think a little more broadly and expand that. Students can come prepared with discussion prompts, students can submit essays or reflection papers, or even go do something of service to their community and then tie that back to the concepts that they're reading about, and that can count as engagement. You wanna be thinking, how are my students engaging not just with me, but with each other, with the course content, and with the broader field or the broader community that they're a part of? All of those things count, and all of those things are important to learning. It's not just about them talking with you. Another notion that I'd like to unpack a bit is this suggestion in my ideas model of diversifying the levels of depth that you are activating in the class. Um, you can think of this along the lines of Bloom's taxonomy, for instance, and, and I like to conceptualize it that way, or you could think of it in terms of other models, but basically you want to have what your students are doing in seminar vary in terms of how sophisticated it is. So in order to accomplish this, I have five routine seminar tasks that I have students do. They're each only going to do each task one time throughout the semester, but with a group of 10, 15, or 20 students, that usually means that in most class periods, I'm getting a planned, organized piece of input from numerous students, and that really helps guide the discussion. So I'll walk you through what those are. At the lower level is what I call a knowledge guide. This is basically a study guide, right? A student reads the readings for that day ahead of time, puts together notes, shares it with the rest of the class. Simple as that, and I imagine a number of you have used that tactic before. One step up from that is what I call the comprehension leader. And so this student will show up and they will start class by talking through the five or so key points of that reading. And it could be basic definitions or it could be themes that they sort of saw repetitively in the chapter or in the article that they read. And they'll just make sure that we're aware of those key nuggets of wisdom. It kind of gets the class all on the same page before we do anything more complicated. One step up from that is the application essayist. And so this is going to be a student who writes an application essay. I call it that specifically because it's sort of in the mid-range of Bloom's taxonomy in terms of sophistication and depth. It's not so simple as to be a directionless journal. It's not a reflection paper, so to speak. Uh, but it's also not a term paper. It's not a proposed research study. It's kind of in the middle. What I'm asking them to do is apply the concepts from the reading to real-life examples or to uh, a hypothetical real-life scenario. It's only a page or two, and usually the students find it rewarding because it gets them thinking about how the concepts from the readings are relevant in their everyday life or in their future career. One step up from that 
is the discussion prompter. And so this is a student who's going to come to class with at least two prepared prompts with the goal of it spurring dialogue. And I literally mean that the person has written out, you know, two, three or more questions that they hope will get the rest of the class churning with ideas. And I don't just say, come to class with discussion prompts, I give them examples, right? So a lot of modeling goes into this. At the beginning of the semester, there's a good three or four class periods in a row where I, as the instructor, do all of these roles to sort of show what I think a decent example of each one is. And I think it also uh, it sort of shows to the students like, hey, I'm imperfect. Sometimes my questions aren't quite as effective as I would hope they would be. And they see that and they see, oh, it's okay to be vulnerable in this class. It's okay to be real. It's okay to share what I'm interested about. And hopefully uh, that sets the tone. It sets trust and respect and uh, sort of appropriate boundaries. So the, the top level of the taxonomy or, or the most sophisticated task that I ask students to do uh, I call this the activity director. And so one student will come to class and their portion will sort of occur toward the end of the class session. And the expectation is that for about 20 minutes or so, they will guide the group through some sort of activity with the imperative that it gets us thinking at a higher, more sophisticated level. Um, so it's not a quiz about vocab terms, right? It's something a little more complicated. Some of the suggestions and examples that I give to students for this activity director role include things like having the class break up into teams and have a structured debate, uh, using breakout rooms so that the students can talk in smaller groups and compare ideas about something. Um, and another one that's great for a number of my therapy and mental health related classes is to have them find video examples of counseling sessions and we watch it as a group and then the activity director guides us through looking for certain concepts, critiquing what the clinician did, or offering alternatives to how they could have handled the session differently. That sort of stuff really gets students thinking and it's hard not to engage at that point, right? Because there's this shared notion of we're all doing this on the fly, we're all thinking off the top of our heads, but we're pulling from the readings and it's just happening live and it's, it's engaging. Um, it's hard not to want to share your ideas when the students are all taking turns doing this and they feel uh, proud of what they have to offer. So that spectrum of tasks from knowledge guide to comprehension leader to application essayist discussion prompter and activity director is just my way of trying to bring to life that spectrum of depth in a seminar class. I would really love to know what you do in your seminars to enact significant learning experiences. I also thought I would end with just some pros and cons. Um, certainly, if you're teaching a seminar in this sort of format where you're handing off a lot of the autonomy to the students, uh, there's a lot of risk involved in that. There are occasionally class periods that are awkward because a couple of students get confused about something and we need to sort of backtrack and make sure we're all on the same page. Um, I have to keep fresh on the readings because as the world changes, uh, relevant applications of the unit concepts are going to change. Um, I don't put in maybe quite as much prep work in terms of having PowerPoints and having structured quizzes and that sort of stuff, but I put in a lot of work in the moment and afterwards to sort of help shape things as the semester moves along. Giving feedback um, and sort of you know gently um, correcting and adjusting the conversation as it's happening. So you really have to walk into the class energized and, and ready to go and ready to uh, be a part of molding it together. I find it really exciting and rewarding, but it does take a lot of energy. One more thing I'll point out quickly, sort of circling back to this ideas model that I presented on the poster, is the notion of activating an atmosphere that really encourages student input. Uh, one thing that I think is important about that is the way that we choose the content that we're exposing students to. Is it contemporary? Uh, is it reflective of the diverse field of psychology? Is it reflective of the world that we live in? Finding and incorporating up-to-date readings in your seminar classes is definitely going to help keep students engaged, but it's also something that you can have the students help you with. Uh, for instance, in the end of the semester, you could assign some sort of term paper or project where the students are responsible for digging up resources which are current and which challenge the status quo in various ways or which incorporate uh, a wider diversity of perspectives. Bring that to the table, talk about it with them. 
have them compare and contrast that against some of the more classical notions that maybe you presented at the beginning of the semester. Have them look closely at the methods of those articles and check the thinking. The more that they are modeled critical thinking and the more that the students are shown that they too can have a voice, the more engaged they're going to be. Uh, that's going to be a significant learning experience for them. So these are just some of my ideas about how to maximize significant learning experiences in your upper level psychology seminars. I really hope to hear from you all. This was a valuable project for me because it was a great opportunity to talk with my students about what makes the seminar work well and what should be changed. I learned a lot from checking out the literature, talking to the students in my classes, and having detailed dialogue with my research assistants, Makaya Tunstall, Brianna Vanderstelt, and Allison Booms. They're just wonderful. Uh, they really opened my mind to a lot of things about what the student experience is like in a seminar, and it's helped me gradually make more and more changes to how I do this. I imagine many of you are going through the same process, so please do connect with me and we can share ideas. Uh, that's all I have to offer. Uh, thanks again for watching, and I will post some links in the video description so that you can get access to some of the things that have inspired uh, the way I do seminars. Have a great day.